right, so we're going to talk about a bit about the working groups that we have had in this program throughout 2019. I'm not really big on pictures, but I thought I would try. Um, <laughs> I thought this sort of nicely represented our progress in the program, kind of like sculpting a statue. You sort of have an idea of what you're doing, and as you continue, it gets more and more refined and detailed. And so we're in the process of shaping this program. Uh, with all of our stakeholders, FDA, medical device industry representatives, MBIC, and the Institute. So we were pretty aggressive. We had seven working groups that we identified for 2019 uh, to tackle various topics. Uh, just at a high level, we had one targeting additional regulatory uh, modifications that we could consider for participants in the program. Uh, we also had a working group targeting performance measures. So quarterly after the appraisal, we collect performance measures to see how the activities organizations are pursuing after their appraisal are impacting their performance. This working group is intended to identify how we're collecting that information, how we can improve that collection process, what kind of themes we're seeing out of that, um, improve the methodology, um, and then synergies for monitoring. We have two working groups tackling various types of appraisals. So in reappraisals, how do we continue to add value to organizations as they continue through the program? The first appraisal is really a baseline of where the organization stands today against a set of best practices that were identified for the medical device industry. And as they continue through their journey, how do they get value out of that? With multi-site appraisals, we're looking at things like capturing more of the value stream, um, if multiple locations are working with the same management leadership, how is that functioning collectively? Uh, so again, about being able to provide value to organizations participating in the program. We also, uh, before we had more structured governance, we had a program features working group that was tackling identification of new product program features that we wanted to see incorporated, and then maybe some less desirable features we wanted to see uh, faded out. We also had a medical device context working group. This working group was intended to identify examples of what kinds of things we might look for in a medical device space uh, to help the organization adopt um, best practices easier. And then an organization looking at EU agencies to see if we could start the conversation um, with other regulators as well. So we were able to accomplish quite a few things in 2019. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about some of the highlights. So for our additional regulatory benefits working group, uh, the main accomplishment we achieved in 2019 was being able to release a simplified original PMA manufacturing module submission. Um, so this is one part of the original PMA and um, enables us to look at some of the information we're collecting from the appraisal to supplement uh, that information. For our reappraisal and multi-site working groups, we were able to identify um, supporting information and guidelines that we could offer to organizations so that they could, again, get the most value out of this appraisal process and their involvement in the program. Uh, so this is based off of lessons learned and feedback that we collected from organizations and our appraisers. And from program features, um, did a couple of different policy type things, but I think the main uh, piece that's come out of this is various FAQs that uh, people have, have asked us, we've answered again and again. Uh, we finally put together the top set of questions and have them published now for access to the public. So going in a little bit more detail here, um, some of the reappraisal supporting guidelines and information uh, this is going to be made available in greater detail on our website, but I'm just going to cover some of the highlights of the things that we've learned here. So for organizations that are going past their baseline appraisal and looking at where they might expand or how they might shift the way that they look um, at, a, at their appraisal process in the program, we've identified some um, guidance or guidelines for them here. So we've identified a core set of practice areas uh, that every organization should be looking at in every year around governance, implementation infrastructure, and measuring performance. If you want to know more about this, I'm happy to talk with you offline um, or answer questions at the end. So a core set of practice areas that help maintain consistency as we look at organizations uh, year over year. 
you've also identified that there are a flexible number of practice areas that you could consider either expanding to, because there are 11 we look at in the baseline, uh, so you could expand to any of the other 25 or so that we have, or you could move up in capability. So there are five um, levels of capability you can look at in the model, uh, so you can continue to, to look up that way, so broader or higher. In the baseline appraisal, we focus on development practices, but we also have services practices, supplier management practices, um, data, people, high maturity, uh, so a wide range of different views you could look at in the model. And so we've provided some um, guidelines about if you want to pursue those other areas of the model, focus on different aspects of your organization, how you might go about doing that. We've also identified uh, a little bit more information about how to do the performance report during reappraisals because we are collecting those quarterly um, and we were noticing that uh, that wasn't necessarily happening in the quarter that the reappraisal was occurring. We've also identified um, what might be considered a conflict of interest. We know many organizations choose to work with their appraisers uh, in between their appraisals to help them um, continue to drive improvements in their organization. So just recognizing uh, when that might pose a conflict of interest and how we go about resolving that. And then some organizations want to dive deeper into their processes. So how do we look at other sources of objective evidence? Um, as we've mentioned many times before, our primary source of objective evidence during the baseline appraisal is through affirmation. So talking with people who actually do the work, uh, seeing the work being performed. Uh, so other things you could be doing around tours, uh, around uh, listening in on various meetings, um, tool demos, uh, and then other kinds of documentation we might want to look at. And then all of the exceptions to these guidelines. So we recognize that we're still in early phases. This is based on what we've learned today. But as we continue to go through the pilot, there might be new things we learn, new things we need to consider. So anything that is an exception to the recommendations, we're always willing to consider and see how that fits in. In terms of multi-site appraisal support, uh, some of the things we recognize around, again, those core practice areas that if we're looking at multiple facilities within an appraisal, that we should still be looking at those core practice areas at each of those facilities and be conducting the various validation activities at both of those facilities as well. One of the main things that we're looking for when we consider multi-site appraisals are what kind of synergy we can see across sites if they if they have two different quality management systems two different leadership structures two different sets of products that might not be a good set of candidates for a multi-site appraisal um, but if any of those overlap then we, we can consider that one of the things around that is this concept of cost versus value um, we've noticed that generally speaking when we perform multi-site appraisals it's a higher cost than a typical appraisal but a lower cost Per site. Now, as we consider how we can make this cost effective for organizations, we also want to keep the focus on the value that we're providing to organizations as we look at this overarching appraisal. Also, things around geographic constraints, time constraints. So, some of these multi site appraisals we've looked at have been 15 miles apart, other ones have been in different continents. Um, so just thinking about how logistically we go through that activity. And then this concept of combined and distinct results. So um, how do we look at the way that structure performs overall, the handoffs maybe between design, design transfer, and manufacturing? Um, and then how does it look distinctly so that organizations can allocate their resources appropriately to um, any kind of continuous improvement activities? And one of the things we're considering is how far can we expand this? So we've done two site appraisals, we've done three site appraisals, some organizations have 40, 50, 60 sites. So how far can we take this realistically? It's one of the things we're exploring. Well, all right, here we go. Um, 
so in the program features working group, I'm not going to provide you the answers to the questions, but I will let you know some of the questions that we have now answered and encourage you to go on our website and see the answers to these questions. Um, so we're now, uh, we've provided some high level answers to these common questions that we get around, what do I need to do to prepare for my first appraisal? What data of mine is going to be shared and who's it going to be shared with? What is the purpose of this performance report and how am I supposed to do these checkpoint activities? What's the expectation there? How is the program ensuring that it's maintaining quality and consistency throughout this entire process? Um, and then what are my obligations to improve against the results that have been identified in my appraisal? Um, one of the things we're hoping to add to this group is, again, additional support and uh, guidance or guidelines on how to do the performance report to get the most value out of it. All right, I'm gonna try this and see, and if not, I will move over. All right, so around, um, some of the work that we're continuing to do around the performance measures working group. Uh, so we're analyzing the data right now to try to look for trends and themes, commonalities that we might see, um, and then document some of the lessons learned and, and the, the guidelines or support information that can help organizations to do the most with this data um, and how to provide that data so that this program can support them. And with the ultimate goal of eventually helping organizations to use this information to measure how they're doing against broader industry. Within the medical device context working group, uh, we're currently having discussions against specific practice areas and uh, starting to build content uh, that we can then put into our online model viewer uh, with the goal of helping organizations that are newer existing uh, be adopting and, and um, implementing changes faster. So going from that uh, crawl, walk, run. And then with EU agencies, we're still very much in the brainstorming, uh, identifying who are the right people to be having conversations with, um, and recognizing that this is something that we're starting now because it's going to take a lot of time before we get um, anywhere there like we are here. All right, so we'll pause for questions. Hey, can you talk a little bit more, please, about what you have done in terms of um, developing a PMA template? What does it cover, um, and how, what was the development process? So I think I'd prefer someone who's more familiar with the regulations to speak to exactly what it covers. So this guy may turn to you or Blada. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of how it was developed, yeah, you could you could take the first shot. All right, repeat the question. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. So it is. Um, it's actually intended to be. It would be part of the submission, but what it does is it replaces what's typically put into the manufacturing section. So it's a simplified uh, portion of that piece that's based off of you know some of the feedback we got internally and some of the feedback we got from facilities to try to streamline that down and focus it on in key pieces. So we're trying to get that tested out. Um, we just haven't had a lot of PMAs coming in since we started the pilot. It's been quite interesting. Okay. So one of the projects that I'm familiar with that adds in that PMA working group. Um, is involved in is trying to identify portions of PMA submissions that can be uh, made subject to a template, just just for members and other interested parties, not to suggest that they should adopt what we put together, that we can um, identify um, components of PMA submissions and then promote a templated approach amongst our members and other industry members. Um, maybe that's better for them and better for FCA. So my question is, is there the 
potential to share output from this work more broadly than just case for pilots. <laughs> um, yeah, so essentially what we did was, um, so the guidance for PMA manufacturing, what we look to do is the kind of uh, focus the review and the submission to the areas that are most important or more applicable to the process and the product under, or the device under review. I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, it's also on the CMMI uh, website, I believe, um, but I can share it with you. And if, if you need, um, I guess, further co collaboration of maybe what the agency said or input, um, I'd be happy to work with you as well. Uh, just to add to that, if you guys are doing and considering other pieces and other elements across the full template, we'd be interested in hearing think what you guys are thinking about too and what's going on from that standpoint. That'll be helpful. Um, one more thing that um, we were considering as we were putting together this template is the fact that it might be applicable across the board, not just within the case for quality, um, but it gives us an opportunity to actually pilot this new uh, approach. Um, uh, are we getting everything that we need to make the decision? And is it easy for industry, least burdensome for an applicant to follow? Um, is it clear? And how can we further modify that? And um, maybe in the future, could we do something more? Yeah, I think that's a Right, so it, it was limited to the manufacturing module portion of it and not more broadly across definitely interested in collaborating if we can. Other questions? Okay, so if you're curious, I've put a link and I think these slides will be made available to you afterwards, um, but there's a link if you're interested in learning more about what are the requirements for participation or eligibility, the link to the FAQs, the link to the application, and then contact information if you have additional questions. Um, for us about the program, it would be the top email if you have questions for FDA uh, about anything. Uh, this is the main email for this program. All right, thank you.